Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Traffic Shaping and Resource Pools. In this lesson, we're going to learn all about how to shape and control traffic going in and out of the virtual switches. So first, we'll start off with just the purpose of traffic shaping, or you know, why we go through the trouble to do these sorts of things. Then, configuring the basic traffic shaping options that you'll find in the vSwitch and the VDS. Next, some special features we get with the VDS. And then, network I.O. control. Network I.O. control is going to be one of those killer features for the VDS that gives you a lot more flexibility than what you get with a standard V-switch. Finally, we'll talk about jumbo frames, which is an interesting conversation for something that's really so simple. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. So why do we traffic shape? Well, to put it simply, you know, not all traffic should be treated equally. You may find some things like vMotion will saturate links when you start putting a host in a maintenance mode, or if DRS should suddenly decide to move some things around. So you may want to put that, say, a lower priority, or you may want to give something else a much higher priority. You may have something like voice over IP that really needs to be high priority, and you know it's very latency sensitive, so we want to make sure it moves up. You also want to make sure that something doesn't overrun and use too much resources. So you may find that you know VM traffic it's a very high priority and you want to keep something else as a lower priority or even you know inside different VMs you may want one set of VMs maybe production to have priority or get a larger share of your network IO and have other VMs like dev or test have a smaller percentage so there's a lot of different reasons to do traffic shaping often we'll see contention occur during peak hours you know again maybe you're doing a backup window or something like that or just middle of the day and we start hitting contention some traffic's very sensitive to latency, voice over IP, video, and even vSphere's fault tolerance are all very latency sensitive. So we want to make sure those have a low latency. We want to make sure that goes out first. We want to make sure that it has you know, higher priority so that we don't impact the usability of those features. Others can be throughput intensive. You know, latency's not as big a deal, but it's going to throw a lot of stuff across the wire. vMotion being one, you know, with vSphere 5, you know, starting with 4.1, but now again with 5, if you have a 10 gig connection on your server, vMotion will fire off 8 vMotions at once, and it'll use 8 gigabit. This can cause I.O. starvation and other issues for other VMs. Fault tolerance can be throughput intensive. We already said it's latency sensitive, but, you know, depending if it's the VM is very busy, doing a lot of memory and CPU changes, then you'll find that it also can be throughput intensive. And NAS storage is almost always intensive and it's it is more latency sensitive it's not as sensitive as say voice over IP or video but we want to make sure and keep that in check and again you know if you're doing you know VM copies or moves for something that doesn't support the array offloads it can throw a lot of you know bandwidth or throughput across those network connections so all of these kind of come together and can create some sort some types of contention and therefore we use traffic shaping to keep those things under control so the standard vSwitch offers basic traffic shaping. It's, it, you'll see here in a second, it's pretty simple, and it only applies to egress traffic, and this is a little bit of a confusing terminology. So you have to understand that egress means leaving the vSwitch, not the host, not the VM, but the vSwitch. So if a VM is sending a lot of data, it first you know, leaves the VM and goes into the vSwitch. So that's ingress. Then, as the vSwitch hands it over to the physical NICs, that is egress, and that's where these traffic shaping take effect. You know, inversely, traffic coming in over the wire from a physical NIC into the vSwitch is ingress traffic, and then as it leaves the switch to the VM, that is egress. So that's where it's going to apply the policy is on the egress. So these settings apply to each virtual NIC attached to the vSwitch or port group. And, you know, it depends on if you're applying it to the port group or to the vSwitch as to which one, but it's important to understand this for sizing. When you do these things, like a minute we'll talk about, you know, average throughput that we want to let, you know, something have. If I say your average is 100 megabit, every VM that connects into that vSwitch or port group averages 100 megabit. It's not a global or a switch-wide setting. It is a VM kind of or connection-wide setting. So you have to take a look and get the cumulative effect of all of these together. So here are the three options when configuring traffic shaping. You'll see them right here. These are the same settings in the, in the vSwitch. And there's some, you know, 
uh, settings, the ones that I've shown you is you'll see here policy exception. So this was probably on a port group and not on the switch since we can set an exception on a port group that overrides the switch, but the fields are the same. So you have three fields to set. First, average bandwidth. This is the average bandwidth in kilobits per second that you want this connection to kind of hover around. Again, it's an average. It'll be a little below, it'll be a little above, but it's the average. And it's in kilobits. Uh, big K, little b. So it's not in megabytes, it's not in megabits, it's not in gigabytes, it's not in gigabits. Kilobits. So make sure you do your conversion. Then we have peak bandwidth. So we're going to let this thing, or we can let it, burst above its average bandwidth. So we're going to say what's the highest throughput you're allowed while bursting, and it's also again in kilobits a second. So it's going to average along at the first setting, and then we're going to let it burst above to the second. Now, how long do we let it burst? Well, that is the function of burst size. So burst size is set in kilobytes, not per second. And the reason is, is that you just say, for how much data are you going to allow this thing to burst? And then the time is just basically going to be, you know, the amount divided by the speed. So we can say that the amount of traffic allowed to be sent in kilobytes, you know, you can say, uh, I'm going to do 1,024 for like one meg or something like that. You know, use the math, convert it to what you need. Maybe you want to let it burst up for 50 meg. Do the math and put it in there. So if your peak bandwidth is, you know, a gigabit a second, you basically take the burst size, divide it by a gigabit a second, and that's kind of how long you're going to let it burst. Here's a diagram, hopefully, making that a little bit clearer. So it's very simple. On the left, we have total bandwidth available. On the right, uh, which covers all three sections, so figure this is the total amount of bandwidth. The first block is the average. So, you know, we set an average amount here, and that's where the VM tries to stay. Then we set a second threshold, which is peak. So this is your peak. When we let it burst up right here, this is as high as it's going to go. So this may be a gigabit total, let's say, and this may be 700 megabit, and this may be 400 megabit, whatever. So we're going to let it burst up another 300 megabit per second and run along. Then we set the amount of the burst, the burst size. So that's our third setting. So we say, okay, you can do a burst size of 50 megs, something like that. What we do is the, the length of burst is, again, the size over the bandwidth. So you don't get to say you get to burst up to 700 megabit for 45 seconds. You say you get to burst up to 700 megabit for 50 megabytes of data. Now you can do your own math and work backwards and say, okay, if I want to let it burst for 45 seconds and I want to let it burn an extra 300, what's that add up to? And you can figure that out. But again, those are your three settings. Your average, your peak, and your burst size. So with the vSphere Distributed Switch, you get a couple of more options. So you get the same basic controls as the vSwitch with one exception. The exception is these apply to ingress and egress. So it does apply both ways. It kind of helps smooth out that traffic shaping. And more importantly, if a host is getting flooded with data as you know, vMotions are coming into a host, it's very important with the VDS that we can now apply some of these settings and therefore we don't get overrun. You also that, you know, same thing here, ingress means into the switch, egress means out of the switch, but you can control it both ways. You also get network I.O. control. Network I.O. control, NIOC, is very cool. It basically lets you assign shares and limits and create network resource pools. So we'll talk about this in a second, but it gives you the ability like you can do with memory and CPU where you have shares, limits, and all that. We can do the same thing with network traffic. You can also do COS or class of service marking and tagging of frames. And COS is real simple. We can put a tag on a frame as it leaves the vSphere host or the VDS switch really and say, okay, this has a priority of four. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, four just doesn't mean anything. It's on a scale of one to seven. But the point being is that, you know, you can scale things up and down. Now, what you do is on the physical switch side, you say, hey, if you see a frame with a marking of four, it needs to put it in this kind of this QoS setting so it knows what to do. So you can mark some some frames leaving as high priority, some as low priority. vSphere doesn't do anything with these. It's really more for your physical switch. We'll talk about that more in a second. 
And as we've discussed in a previous lesson, you also get load-based teaming. And again, it's the only load balancing that accounts for physical NIC load. So again, here's the basic traffic settings, but you can split them for ingress and egress. Settable for both applies to each port, say VM NIC attached to the port group. And uh, you just go through set them, you know, however you want to. Again, average, peak, and burst. I don't have a really good example for setting these for you. It depends on your environment. And to be completely honest, it's not real common to see these used. The reason being is, is you have to really understand your network workload. You have to really understand what it's using for, really understand where you want it to be, and kind of set these parameters. Now, I do see them used for some kind of maybe dev and test where they will kind of limit what those VMs can do. Production, it's used less so. Network I.O. control is far more popular. So now let's really jump into network I.O. control. It allows for very fine tuning of traffic shaping. You have to be using the vSphere distributed switch. You can't do this with the vSwitch because it is kind of switch wide, you know, multi-host. It looks at everything. So you can set shares on you can set shares, limits, and class of service tags on different traffic types. So you'll have vMotion, fault tolerance, NFS, iSCSI management, VM, traffic, and vSphere replication. Those are some examples. You can also add your own. So this is one good feature that is now in network I.O. control. Originally with NIOC, all VM traffic was kind of grouped together. I'll show you shares and everything in a minute, but you would assign shares to all VM traffic. Whether it was high priority, low priority, you didn't get to choose. VM traffic was in one big old bucket, and that's, that's all there was to it. With vSphere 5, we can now do network resource pools. And really what it does is it allows you to say, okay, I'm going to create a resource pool, I'm going to give you X number of shares, and I'm going to put these port groups in that pool. Then you can have you know, high priority, low priority VMs, that sort of thing. You can set its own shares, its own limits, its own class of service tags, and really you can do it on individual port groups or groups of port groups, and we'll, we'll see this more in the lab. Shares in NIOC act like CPU and memory shares. You know, they provide priority in times of contention, and that's a key point I want you to understand, times of contention. Shares don't mean anything if there's no contention. So if I give, you know, VM traffic really high priority and vMotion really low priority, but there's no VM traffic really going across the connection, then vMotion can burst up and use what it wants to use. That's the great thing about shares. You know, there's no total number of shares predefined, meaning there's no okay, here's 100 shares, you dole them out as you see fit. The only thing is that for a specific traffic, traffic type, the maximum is 100. So I cannot give VM traffic 120 shares. The most I can give to any one type is 100. But I could give every type 100, plus all my resource pools 100, and have, you know, 2,000 shares out there. That just means that vMotion is really only going to get 1 20th of that, or say 5%, if everything was under contention. So you just kind of keep that in mind. Again, we'll see that here in the lab, but it's very much like CPU shares and memory shares. You can also do limits. I can say, vMotion, you are limited to one gig a second, no more. Now, what's the issue there? Well, the issue there is the same reason I usually tell you not to do like CPU limits, because shares allow us to adjust what happens under contention. Limits always apply. So no matter what's going on, if all the other traffic is just dead, it's just, you know, it's 3 in the morning, your servers aren't doing anything, you decide, I'm going to put this host in maintenance mode. Right-click, put him in maintenance mode, and you're like, wow, this sure is taking a long time. Well, it's taking a long time because you set a limit of 1 gig a second for vMotion, and that's what he's having to abide by. If you had used shares and done things as kind of a proper distribution, vMotion would be bursting up and using as much as it can. That's why I say be really careful how you use limits. You may only want to do that, say, if you have dev or test VMs that connect to dev and test port groups that you define, then you create a resource pool, and then you set a limit on that. That I'll agree with, but for most things, I do not agree with setting limits unless you have a very specific use case. We talked about class of service a minute ago. It allows you to tag frames with a service type, and the VDS uses what's known as 802.1p, which is layer 2 tagging. There's layer 2 and there's layer 3 tagging. It's just important to know this is layer 2. By itself, this does nothing. vSphere says, okay, I'll tag it. I tagged it. Okay. It doesn't set a priority. 
what matters is when a frame leaves a vSphere host with a tag that your physical switches are configured to do something. Meaning, you'll usually configure some sort of a policy that when it sees a frame tagged, it will apply that policy to it. Maybe it'll move it up, maybe it'll move it down the queue, maybe it does something different. You know, it just depends. So the idea is that you consider the vSphere host to be trusted in your quality of service environment, so when a frame comes out and it's tagged, your physical switches know what to do with it. Therefore, all that work is going to be done on the physical switches by whomever manages those. But you can set these. Just remember, the only place to set class of service tagging is with the VDS and using network I.O. control. If you want to use you know, 802.1p, you don't really care about network I.O. control, then you may just want to enable it, set all the shares to be equal, and just go about your business, but just go ahead and configure it to tag those frames. So now let's jump over to the lab. In the lab, we're just going to walk through network I.O. control. So we're going to tour it. We're going to create a network resource pool and really just kind of look through the features, show you how to set shares, show you how to set limits, how to create these resource pools, how to put port groups in them, all that stuff so you'll know how to use network I.O. control. So with that, let's jump on over and we'll get started with NIOC. Here we are again in the lab, same basic lab with my three hosts. And let's go ahead. So to look at network I.O. control, we go to inventory networking. And we're on the uh, virtual distributed switch. So let me just kind of move this over. And you'll notice there's a resource allocation tab, and that's where we set this up. When you first come in here, it's probably going to be disabled for you. So if you go to properties, Here's where you check the box. So if I hit that, it'll go through. It's probably going to complain because I have a host powered down due to dynamic power management. So just ignore those. When that host comes back alive again next time, it'll push down any changes that we make. But when you come in, it's probably going to be disabled. So we'll go to Properties. We'll say OK and OK. If you notice at the top, it says here we have total number of, net, or of physical adapters is 10 and the total network capacity is basically 10 gigabit which is a little which is you know 10 times 1 gigabit is 10 gigabit where does it get those numbers uh, if you come to the configuration tab here what we see is kind of a snapshot view like you would see on a host for the distributed switch but this is kind of switch wide so if we expand these and you can see it here so in the dv uplink 1 i have 3 dv uplink 2 i have 3 connections 3 has 2, 4 has 2, 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 2 is 10. And that's what we saw a second ago. So if I expand these out, you'll see that I don't have all hosts rolled over equally. So Optimus, Bumblebee, and Megatron, Optimus, Bumblebee, and Megatron, uplinks 3 and 4 does not have Optimus just for some testing. So that's where it gets those numbers from. In case you're just wondering, you go in there, you've got a large cluster, and you know it might say there's 70 NICs up here, and you know, 70 gigabit of throughput, or if you're using 10 gig connections, you know, some crazy number up there. But basically, that's where it pulls that from. Down here, we have the standard network types. So these are predefined. We can't change these. Fault tolerance, iSCSI, management, NFS, virtual machine, the default virtual machine for things that we haven't specified out in a resource pool, vMotion, and vSphere replication. If you've never seen vSphere replication traffic, it is a new feature in 5 that goes along with Site Recovery Manager 5, which allows you to do host-based replication instead of array-based replication for DR failover. You can only use that with Site Recovery Manager. But if you want to do traffic shaping, it's already plugged in. Down here, user-defined network resource pools. This is blank because I do not have any, so there's nothing there. On the tabs, we've got your resource pool, host limit, that means if I got 20 hosts, it's not a limit that applies aggregate across all 20, it is per host. So if I say vMotion limit is one gigabit there, that means each host can do a gigabit, not a gigabit across all hosts. Adapter shares is, you know, low, medium, high, or custom, which in turn changes my numeric values here. And then we have our QoS or COS class of service priority tags. Now, you can uh, look at one example, let's say iSCSI traffic. So I double click that, or I click it, and we can set the different options. Physical adapter shares, normal, and if we look, normal is 50. VM traffic, by default, and these are all default settings, gets 100. So it's going to allow it to kind of go higher than anything else. 
Now, remember how shares work. Right here we have 50, 50, 50, 50, 100, 50, 50. You have a total of 400 shares. Let's say all traffic was trying to send simultaneously. FT was going, iSCSI was going, management traffic, NFS, VM, vMotion, and replication were all fighting contention. What happens? Well, basically, these are going to get one eighth of the throughput. This guy is going to get one fourth of the throughput because he is a ratio that is, you know, twice as much as anybody else or one fourth of the total aggregate number of shares. So again, Shares doesn't start at 100 and you hand it out. You just make up your numbers and you look at the ratios and that's what you get. You know, if you don't send any replication traffic, then really you can not worry about him because he's never going to be part of the contention. Therefore, his shares are never going to come into play. Just understand, again, add them up, look at your ratios. Double-click iSCSI again. You have an option, low, which is going to be, I think it's 25, yes, 25. Normal is 50, high is 100, and custom is whatever you want. I mentioned earlier you can't go above 100, but you can go below 100. So we'll just set that back to normal. Then there's a limit. So if you uncheck unlimited, it's going to let you set a limit in megabits per second. And right now it's 10,000 since that's the maximum. If you want, iSCSI could use all of it. Now, you also got to remember, you know, that it kind of also depends on you know, if you have iSCSI in a port group and that port group is only allowed to use two NICs, then he's never really going to go above two gigabit a second. And so, you know, you need to look at things like that. You know, v if you have VMs in a port group and NICs one through four, or, you know, two of my four uplinks are set as active and the other two are set as unused for that port group, then they're only going to use or load bounce across two gigabit. So really they're not going to use 10, but, you know, it doesn't know that at this level. It doesn't know what your configuration is. Most cases, as I mentioned, you will set this at unlimited. And then there's the QoS priority tagging. None, which is obviously none, or 1 through 7. And again, this means nothing to vSphere. It hopefully means something to your external uh, physical switch. If you don't use any sort of QoS policies, just leave this on none. We'll say OK, probably get an error, blah, blah, blah. And there you go. So you just go through and set that for each of these. Now if you want to do user-defined network resource pools, you just come up here and do new network resource pool. Give it a name, uh, demo network resource pool, and this is a description. All right? You should see my production setups. They're just as informative. Now you do the same thing that we just did. So you set the physical adapter shares. We'll do custom and let me say, I'm going to throw some math and say 75. I'm going to leave it as unlimited. Actually, you know what? I'm not. So let's do 500 megabit. And I'll leave that as none. Say OK. And we have our demo resource pool. So his host limit is 500 megabit. And he has 75 shares. So now you need to add that into the mix which means it kind of devalues or dilutes these other shares, kind of like owning stock options. You know, if you're working at a .com, they give you a 1,000 shares. Next thing you know, they release a whole bunch more shares. Your percentage goes down. That's how VM traffic feels right now. He just got diluted. So we now have an extra 75. I'll leave the math up to the reader, you know, or the listener to figure out the new ratio. But now we have a new resource pool. But it doesn't really do anything. We don't have any port groups in that pool. So let me move this down. So what we want to do is add a resource pool. So you can do this one of a couple ways. One way is to just go click on a resource pool, say FT, manage this distributed port group, go to resource allocation, and select which resource pool you want it to go in. Or if you're going to be doing this a fair bit, you can come back here, manage port groups, and set them here. So if I want to put, say, vMotion in that pool, which doesn't make a lot of sense because you could already manage vMotion traffic, but let's just assume it for now. We'll say external. External is a VM port group. It's not something that I can directly control up here. So let's do that, like that. Say OK. It'll throw an error again, probably. Oh, I guess it didn't. So let me go down here and view port groups, and it'll show you the new external port group. So it shows you a couple of things. What's the name? 
what your port binding, which is just good general information to have, your VLAN ID, it is set for 100, number of VMs in there connected, I've only got one, that's my firewall VM, number of ports, and if alarms are enabled. But what it shows you is, you know, which port groups are now in here. So keep this in mind, if I have 10 port groups in this network resource pool, they all fall under the 75 shares. So they split that up kind of evenly, and that's how much priority they get. So if you want to get really specific and say, well, I don't really like that. I've got four port groups, and I kind of need to be assured that one of those, you know, some VM in one of those port groups isn't going to overrule the other three. In that case, you need to create four different network resource pools, assign them equal share values, put one port group in each one of those, and then you're guaranteed. So just kind of, you know, you got to put some thought into how you're going to do this. But again, it it's pretty simple. I like the fact that it's not a hard limit, so you're not going to be limiting things when they're not under contention. It only applies when they are under contention. And therefore, you know, just set these how you want them, get your percentages right, and off you go. So it's common for us to do a couple of things like, and again, this really does matter if you're not doing physical traffic separation. So this is where network design with vSphere gets kind of, I don't know if I'd call it complicated, but very multi-layered. Now, in most designs that we do or I do, NFS and iSCSI traffic are segregated to specific network interfaces. They don't ever share. They're never going to have to fight against vMotion traffic. So in those cases, it doesn't really matter what you put here. They got their NICs. They're going to just run. But for something that does share VMs or vMotion and management, you may want to do some different traffic shaping. Or, and this is the most common case that we see this these days, is that people are kind of moving away. Well, I won't say in mass, but you know we're starting to see a lot more people just put two 10 gig ports in a server and not you know eight one gig ports that makes this physical separation easy. So if I give you two 10 gig ports and we are sharing everything on those connections, then you need to worry about things like iSCSI or NFS. You probably want to give those a significant share value. VM traffic, the same way, you want to give it a significant share value. vMotion, you probably want to drop that down. Again, it's only under contention. We just want to make sure that vMotion isn't going to run amok and use 8 gigabit of a 10 gig port and cause I.O. starvation because NFS traffic is getting buffered in the switch. It can't send. You're starting to see latency go up on storage, and next thing you know, you have timeouts. So especially if you're looking at 10 gig ports, you really need to be looking at the distributed switch, and you really need to be looking at network I.O. control. So just kind of a heads up there. I can't give you, you know, kind of blanket recommendations on share values and things, but again, you probably want your, if you're using NAS, that needs to be up there. If you're doing VM traffic, you obviously want that up there. That's why it has a default of 100. You may bump vMotion down. You may bump replication down if using it. Management, nah, you know, there's not a lot of management traffic. Giving it 50 shares on this default is being very generous to, v to management traffic. You'd probably want to drop that down to, say, 10. You want to make sure it still sends. You want to make sure it gets through. You want to make sure things still occur. But, you know, it's not like it needs a gigabit a second to do management traffic. So look at look at what you're doing in your environment and make, you know, make good estimates, monitor performance, monitor vMotions, monitor your storage latency, and make adjustments if you need to. You can always come back in here and make additional adjustments on the fly. But with that, I think that's everything here for our Network IO Control Lab. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. couple of considerations when you're doing traffic shaping. First of all, know your traffic workloads. I probably say this all the time to people, you know, know your CPU workloads, know what your memory is, know what your storage workloads are, and know your network workload. Because you can't, you know, again, I can't give you blanket recommendations on kind of QoS. I can give you some kind of things to look out for, but I can't say this is what you need to set it for unless you know your traffic workloads. Some people, they find that their environments, their traffic in and out of the VMs is fairly light. Others, you know, there's a lot of traffic going in and out of their VMs. You just need to understand that if you have different classes of VMs or different capabilities, you want to make sure that you kind of work around those. It's okay to layer options. You may layer NIOC with egress basic shaping. This is kind of a great use case. This was actually brought up in a white paper that I believe, I believe it was VMware that did this white paper, and it, it showed that, that. So basically, it was kind of a demonstration of network I.O. control. And what they showed was, you know, 
we can do vMotions between two systems and, and use network I.O. control and shares to kind of limit that. What happens if host 1 and host 2 are vMotioning to host 3? So that's a lot of data flooding in. Network I.O. control really can't function on that because traffic is being flooded in. There's not a whole lot it can do about it. It can only shape things once they're in the switch. Well, you can then use the basic egress basic traffic shaping on the other hosts. So on host 1 and 2, I could do some basic egress traffic shaping to limit what happens to a vMotion as it leaves that switch heading to host 3. So that's kind of a complex example. You need to look at what you're doing, kind of understand the ramifications of layering that, but it is an option that you can do that. So using network I.O. control doesn't preclude you from using the basic traffic shaping ingress and egress that's part of the vSphere distributed switch. I mentioned it before, use limits very sparingly. They always apply, not just under contention. They always apply. Remember that the settings apply on a per port basis, especially with the basic functionality. But on the network I.O. control, you saw that it was kind of on a per host level. So it was kind of all the VMs on a host. And match your virtual traffic shaping policy with that of your physical environment, especially if you're doing COS QoS tagging. Make sure that those things kind of are fit together. If you have, you know, vMotion as being really low priority on the vSwitch, but really high priority on the physical switch for some odd reason, you may end up with unintended consequences or, you know, symptoms of those type of behaviors. So make sure that those two things match. If they don't match, again, you can end up in a case where traffic is dropped or latency goes up, even though you've got it set to higher priority within the vSwitch, and understand what those two do to each other. Now let's talk about jumbo frames. And this is kind of an odd, well, it's not an odd topic, but I wasn't real sure which lesson to put it in. So I went ahead and put it in here since we're talking kind of about performance, about traffic shaping. And it's a question I get all the time. You know, what about jumbo frames? Should we enable them? Should we not? How do we enable them? What's best practice? So bottom line is this. A normal Ethernet frame is about 1,500 bytes. That's known as the MTU or maximum transmission unit. So what happens is if you're going to send a big file over the network to a file server, the network card in your computer will start breaking things up into 1500 byte chunks. Now there's, you know, headers and tails and all this other stuff on the frames and all this. So you don't really get 1500 bytes of payload per each one, but the total size is 1500 bytes. If you think about it, if I'm sending a lot of those, that's a lot of overhead. Well, it's some overhead, right? I'm sending the same headers and all that stuff every time when I'm trying to do a lot of big, large data copy. What if we could do larger frames? Well, that's what jumbo frames are. The normal size that you'll see in a jumbo frame is about, you're usually up to 9,000 bytes. So it's, you know, six times the size of a regular frame. That means you're doing, you know, one sixth the number of headers and footers or tails or whatever you call them. And, you know, it's just less overhead. There's less calculations, there's less checksums, and there's all that which gives you better efficiency. Both the standard vSwitch and the distributed switch support jumbo frames, as does, say, Cisco's third-party switch. You have to enable them on the switch. You also need to enable them in the guest OS and any VM kernel interfaces, and they need to be enabled across the physical network as well. So, you know, it's it's not a simple thing as checking a box within vSphere. There's a lot more kind of effort that goes into it. Some considerations. Everything in the data path must support jumbo frames. End devices, VMs, switches, routers, everything. If you set up your vSphere host and even your VM guest to do jumbo frames, but that switch that you're connected to does not, you'll see frames dropped. And you'll see that it just doesn't work. So you've got to kind of understand that it has to be end-to-end -end support. Now, jumbo frames used to kind of be tricky. You know, a couple years ago, some things supported it, some things didn't, some NICs did, some didn't. Pretty much any modern gear is going to support jumbo frames. But that doesn't mean that you need to enable it everywhere. Performance gains can be questionable, often in single digits. If you look down, I got two URLs at the bottom. Jason did one, Michael did the other. They're both great guys. I know both of them, and they've done some testing. And Chad Sackatch from EMC, I didn't have room here to put his, but a while back he also did some jumbo frame testing, kind of multi-protocol testing, uh, and, and showed what the performance gains were there. What you're going to find 
in most cases is it's usually not worth doing jumbo frames on one gig connections. 10 gig networks are a different animal, but you got to understand if you see a 5% gain on a 1 gig network, that's not a lot of speed. A 5% gain on a 10 gig network is much more significant. So it's don't run out and feel you need to enable this. And the reason I keep kind of putting disclaimers on this is I get asked this a lot. And it's something that I've had to kind of work with people on because you know they see that it's a best practice or one of my you know one of my pet peeves if you follow me on Twitter when I was at a conference a while ago one of my pet peeves was a blanket best practice recommendation of enable jumbo frames in a lot of sessions talking about application tuning and performance the thing is people hear that and they run out and they feel they need to enable this on all their networks and that's just not the case most often you're going to want to do this on storage networks your biggest bang is often NFS and iSCSI. And even that is kind of questionable because if you look at how NFS or especially iSCSI works, it's not always sending large payloads. So, you know, the performance may be good. It may not make any difference. It just depends on what you're doing. And you're going to need to make sure to do end-to-end -end connectivity testing when you're implementing this because you don't want to get bit by something on the network that doesn't support it. You know, that's why I often see jumbo frames enabled when we have NFS and iSCSI using dedicated storage Ethernet switches connected into, net, you know, NICs on the servers. The only thing we have to worry about are those two dedicated switches, the storage array, and the vSphere host. I have seen people want to go completely jumbo frames all the way through the, the data center core, all the way down to the access layer, and I just don't think it's a good use of resources. I don't think it's worth the benefit. I don't think it's worth the, the effort, and occasionally you'll find an odd device or a third-party something that just doesn't play nice. So with all that, you know, kind of wrapped around it, read the two testing posts by Jason and Michael, take a look at them, kind of look and see how they would be for your environment, and then if you do use NFS and iSCSI, I mean, there's nothing wrong with enabling them. Just make sure you do your testing. So with all of that said, let's jump over to the lab. And we're just going to do a real quick test where I show you how to configure jumbo frames on the vSwitch, the VDS, and any port groups. And I'll show you a quick and easy way to test uh, jumbo frame functionality. So again with that, let's jump on over to the lab. Once again, back to the lab. Now, enabling jumbo frames is pretty simple. On the DVS, we go to the main DVS right here. And again, it's just giving you a warning since one of my hosts are powered down. We go to the main DVS and edit settings. We go to advanced and maximum MTU. I've already set to 9,000. By default, it's going to be 1,500. I've already enabled jum jumbo frames functionality on my DV switch. So you're going to want to head, go ahead and do that there. We'll say OK. Then if you look, there's nothing to set on the port group. So I'll show you that real quick. We'll look at policies. And there's just nowhere here to set MTU. So don't worry about setting it on each of your port groups. If we go and look at hosts, what we'll see, let's take a look at Bumblebee here. At least on the distributed switch to start, let's manage our virtual adapters. Manage one of our VMK interfaces. This is the fault tolerance. That's a good one to play with. Edit. And we need to set it here. So you set it on the main switch, and then you come to each of your VM kernel interfaces and set it here. They'll say OK. And we look at this guy. He is being used for management traffic. So he should, let's see, he's also going to be used for disk traffic in my network. So he's going to connect to NFS. And it just jumped me because it made a change. He's going to be used for the NFS connections as well because my NFS server is on the 192.168.200 network, and that's why I've already set him for 9,000. So if you're going to do it for NFS, you got to make sure the VM kernel is going to use is set for 9,000. And remember, still one of the limitations of vSphere, and this drives me absolutely crazy, is that if your NFS or iSCSI arrays are on the same subnet as one of your management VMKs, it's going to use the first one in the routing table. So for me, it's obviously going to be VMK0, which means this is my management, this is also my vMotion, and you don't get to pick it, but it's also my storage. So we'll say OK there. Now on a standard vSwitch, let's jump over here. Let's take a look at Megatron. See if I've got one here. Uh, I've got an old one here, so we'll just use this. There's no physical NICs connected to it, but it's still functional. 
we'll say properties on the V switch and then we'll edit the V switch double tap that and we get MTU again I've already set mine to 9000 yours will probably be 1500 but you need to set it at the V switch level so you set that and then you need to look at your VM level port groups if you look same thing nothing to check here it's all good but if we were to add say a VM kernel interface we'll just call it jumbo test or jumbo demo VLAN 5 is fine we'll say use it for vMotion go DHCP and IP address say finish it's not going to actually DHCP one because there's no physical NIC but that doesn't matter if we click this we will see MTU is set for 1500 so just like we did for the DV switch or the VDS we hit edit and we change it to 9000 so you have to set it switch wide and then you have to set it on the VM kernel interfaces so we'll say OK now that that's done let's take a look I will jump on Bumblebee he is what's your IP Bumblebee dot 93 so bring up good old friend putty login as root login as my password and we're good now if you look at ping ping gives you a couple of options one of those options is the do not fragment bit and the send size so how do you test jumbo frames Jason well real simple I say hey ping send a ping that's like I don't know 8,000 bytes long and don't fragment it and see if you get a reply so let's do that now let's see my NFS data store should be set for jumbo frames so first of all let's make sure we can ping it 71 we can ping it we if we couldn't ping it all my VMs would be down but for the sake of show let's make sure then we want to go ping space dash D DF is don't fragment and then we want to do dash size let's do 8,000 don't do 9,000 reason being is if you do 9,000 it's going to add a header to it it's going to be above 9,000 and if your jumbo frames are set to 9,000 it's going to try to fragment it it can't fragment it because we just told it not to and it's going to fail no matter what so make it something less than 9,000 bigger than 1500 less than 9,000 also if your network gear doesn't support 9,000 byte jumbo frames maybe they only do 8,000 and that does happen so don't be surprised at that you'll need to make sure everything is limited to 8,000 so we'll say don't fragment 9,000 1 2 1 6, 8, 271 hey and it works if we set it to 9,000 it shouldn't work yeah message too long that is a quick and really easy way to tell if Jumbo Frames works. So if you're having an issue and you want to know if it's working or not, just do a ping, set to don't fragment, set the size to like 8000, and try to ping something on the other side of the network, and you'll see if it works. This works just as well in a VM. If you have a guest, go into the guest and try to do a similar type of ping or connection. Remember, though, that in a guest, like uh, Windows, you're going to need to tell Windows it can do Jumbo Frames. And you're going to need to make sure and use something like VMXNet, preferably two or three, to make sure that it supports jumbo frames. So the early like AMD Net or PC Lance didn't support jumbo frames. So you need to make sure you support it. You set the VM to do it. You set the V switch or D, uh, VDS to do it. Then you set your physical connected switches to do it. And if they're connected to other switches or a router, they've got to be configured for it so it's on down the chain all the way through so you know you may have a router where it supports jumbo frames on the server side and not on another side and that's fine just be aware that that router is then going to have to start fragmenting frames which is going to put more load on the router so again this becomes an ongoing snowball kind of an issue if you start wanting to do jumbo frames everywhere which is why I normally only do it like you see here to my NFS or iSCSI arrays so that's it nothing too crazy on jumbo frames just be aware know when to use them know when not to use them and know how to test and make sure it's working so that sums up this part of the lab let's jump back to the slide deck so that's it for this lesson what did we cover well we covered a lot of stuff we covered the purpose of traffic shaping which is you know not all traffic should be treated equally some traffic just doesn't need to go up the queue as fast as others and you need to make sure that you're not impacting your important traffic negatively 
by overrunning it with less important traffic. Talked about configuring traffic shaping, so we looked at the standard options in the vSwitch. We looked at your average, your peak, and your burst size. Remember that average and peak are in kilobits a second and that the burst was in a set size. It is not a per second. So you just need to make sure of that. Then we had traffic shaping on the VDS. So traffic shaping on there is both ingress and egress. Unlike the standard V-switch, that is just egress. So you know, make sure that you kind of understand the difference there. And understand that the VDS is more powerful since you can set different options going one way and different options going the other way. The big boon for going to VDS and traffic shaping is network I.O. control or NIOC. NIOC requires the VDS but it lets you set shares and limits and create network resource pools and lets you tag frames with a quality of service tag that your physical switches can then use to map those frames to a QoS policy. It's by far the most flexible and it's very, very configurable, especially now in 5.0, where we can do these network resource pools. And finally, jumbo frames. So jumbo frames are regular frames, just bigger. But, you know, their performance gain is often questionable on 1 gig connections. Definitely worth doing on 10 gig, but understand that you need to kind of enable it end-to-end -end from VM guest all the way through the network, and you need to know how to test it and make sure it works. So you wrap all this together, and you should have a really good idea of how you want to shape the network. You can really get flexible. My get my you know suggestion is if you have Enterprise Plus, absolutely enable VDS, absolutely enable network I/O control, absolutely use load-based teaming, and then you have a very very good sort of traffic shaping configuration. Go in there and make sure that you you know bump up things like VM traffic or NFS or iSCSI push down some things, maybe like management, maybe like vMotion, and be really careful in how you use limits because, again, those always apply. So that's it for traffic shaping, and that's it for this lesson. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.